is a black body frequency spectrum with uh, temperature 2.726 Kelvin. I'm just showing off the number of digits to which this has been measured. Um, if you went back in time to a previous temperature, to a previous uh, value of the scale factor, at an earlier time, this temperature would be higher. If I take every uh, I won't write out the details, but you can check that if you take the black body spectrum with one value of the temperature, and then you blue shift every photon by a factor of A inverse, that you get another black body spectrum with temperature increased by a factor of A inverse. So when the scale factor was one half, the temperature was twice this value, and so on. So you could think of uh, the temperature as a time coordinate which decreases as the universe evolves. Um, so Today the temperature is 2.726 Kelvin, which I'll also write as the number on the order of one milli electron volt. Uh, if you went back to when the scale factor was 10 to the minus three or so, when the universe was one thousandth of its present size, so that the temperature was 3,000 Kelvin, or around one eV, then uh, something interesting would happen uh, after this time. Most of the electrons in the universe are in neutral hydrogen, but uh, that's the thermodynamically favored state at low energies, or low temperatures. Uh, but if the temperature is higher than um, 3,000 Kelvin, roughly, then uh, hydrogen ionizes to a plasma of protons and electrons. Uh, there are enough photons with energies comparable to the 13.6 eV binding energy of hydrogen to ionize the hydrogen atoms. Um, so the universe, so the thermodynamic state of the universe can change as we um, unwind the clock. I don't want to call this a phase transition because it's a continuous process with no discontinuities or non-analytic behavior. Um, the next event that would happen as you go back in time or up in temperature is uh, if you go up to uh, uh, an energy of 0.5. Um, MeV, mega electron volts. Um, that's the rest of mass of a electron. So uh, before this time, there would be enough photons around of high enough energy that a pair of photons can uh, combine and produce an electron positron pair. And so uh, the favorite thermodynamic state of the universe would be a plasma consisting of uh, photons and a comparable number of electrons and positrons. Um, when the temperature goes below this value, then uh, it's thermodynamically favored for the you know, E plus E minus pairs to find each other and annihilate to photons of uh, um, A little bit before that, at around 1 MeV, is a uh, neutrino freeze out. Oh, yeah. I, I paused for a sec because I knew I, I wanted to say add something, but I forgot what it was. Uh, so you might wonder why there are any electrons left in the universe at all after this annihilation has taken place. And uh, that is because uh, the in the initial conditions of the universe, there are slightly more electrons around than positrons, so that uh, even after um, the maximum amount of possible amount of annihilation has taken place, there are still some electrons. Um, why that asymmetry exists uh, and why it has the value that it does um, is uh, a an unsolved problem in particle physics, I would say. And uh, as a result, the um, Number of electrons, the number density of electrons today, or equivalently the fraction of the universe in baryonic matter, um, is a free parameter of the cosmological model that we can't predict from theory. Um, so, what neutrino freeze out means is that, uh, well, so after this time, 
the universe is a plasma of protons, of, of um, mostly um, photons, positrons, and electrons that uh, can all turn into each other and, and are all in thermal equilibrium. And uh, before this time, the neutrinos are also in thermal equilibrium uh, with the plasma. For example, a pair of electrons, or an electron-positron pair, can uh, combine to form a Z boson that can turn into a neutrino antony. Um, and uh, as you keep going back, uh, many other interesting thing things happen, like the next event on the list. There's a timeline of maybe 10 interesting events. Um, so uh, just for fun, let me mention the, the next interesting event on this list would be muon annihilation. When the temperature of the plasma is the rest mass of the muon. And uh, if you went way back, skipping over a few steps at a temperature of around 200 GeV, uh, you would find the uh, electroweak phase transition where the Higgs gets its expectation value. There'd be some phase transition where the symmetry, the SU3 times SU2 times U1 symmetry group was broken to the standard model gauge group. Or two, the SU2 times U1 is broken to U1. Um, Anyway, in this lecture, I'm really just going to focus on these two steps. And uh, the main thing that I want to do is analyze the thermodynamics and uh, show you that I arrive at the prediction of a cosmic neutrino background. An analysis of these two steps, neutrino freeze out and E plus E minus annihilation, will lead to the prediction of a cosmic neutrino background with a uh, Temperature four elevenths to the one thirds times the CMB temperature is 1.95 Kelvin today. And uh, also lead to some interesting statements about neutrino mass. Um, I want to start by uh, doing a generalization of the, if you've taken statistical mechanics, you've seen the calculation of the black body spectrum. So, um, which is the energy density of a gas of photons at some temperature. So I want to generalize this to a plasma consisting of many particles that aren't uh, necessarily photons. I want to think about some volume V, which contains a thermal plasma at temperature T. And, uh, that could be any number of uh, species of particle that are all in thermal equilibrium with each other. Uh, they could be bosons or fermions. Uh, could be massive or massless. And with uh, arbitrary spin. And uh, I'm going to assume that by a thermal plasma, what I mean is that the Boltzmann distribution that says that uh, the probability of any Multi-particle state is proportional to its e to the minus energy over the temperature. Uh, applies to all states. So that that assumption would be violated if, for example, there were a conserved quantum number that meant that uh, one state could not transition into another state by some sort of thermal process. So I'm assuming that. Uh, there are no conserved quantities, and that particles may be, uh, including particle numbers, so particles may be uh, freely created or destroyed, and uh, every state in the box uh, has a probability proportional to e to the minus e over t. Um, so, uh, and I want to calculate, for example, the total energy density in the box. Uh, so first, I'd like to consider one mode. Um, 
Well, sum over modes next. Where mode means uh, a fixed momentum. Uh, only one particle species. And uh, only one spin state. Uh, so given one mode, the uh, occupation number, the number of particles in the mode, is uh, um, is a random variable, a Boltzmann distributed random variable. Once I, once I fix the mode that is this triple of data, then uh, the only number left to specify is the occupation number. So uh, that occupation number, I'm assuming, is uh, distributed. The um, energy of the mode if the occupation number is n, is e to the minus n ep over t, where ep is the, uh, throughout the lecture will be the energy of a particle of some mass m and momentum p. And uh, if the particle is a fermion, then the occupation number can only be zero or one, whereas if it's boson, it can go up to infinity. So let me, uh, let me anal analyze the fermion case uh, first. Um, so when the, the particle is a fermion, then the proportionality constant that I need to supply here is this, in order to make the n equals 0 and n equals 1 probability sum to 1. And so um, uh, I'm also going to introduce the notation little f. That's a standard notation for the mean occupation number. And uh, that would just be given by summing n times t of n, in this case from uh, 0 to 1, or In other words, getting this. Okay. Uh, for the Bazana case, I'll have to do a series. So if the particle was a boson, n can be any non-negative integer. The probability of having occupation number n. Now the denominator here is this infinite series. The mean occupation number f, f would be given by, I guess I'll write this in the denominator, I'll write m instead of n. Makes a little more sense. Um, so the mean occupation number uh, would be given by summing n times p of n. That's uh, the ratio of two infinite series. And uh, the denominator is a geometric series. This is the sum of x to the m, where x is e to the minus e p over t. So it's uh, 
1 minus c to the dp over c to the minus 1. And uh, the numerator is a geometric series with this extra factor of n put in, which is one of the formulas that I had on the board at the end of the uh, last lecture. And uh, the sum of n times x to the n we found was x over 1 minus x squared. So uh, putting that in here, I get e to the minus energy over t times 1 minus e to the minus. To the minus. Then uh, I'll simplify that to this is the answer for a boson. The mean occupation number for a boson in a thermal plasma. This was the answer for a fermion. Um, I can combine both of those. Convenient way to combine both of those formulas. Uh, is to write the mean occupation number as, I'm going to write it this way. 1 minus plus e to the minus c where uh, CP is this, and uh, the uh, upper sign. So in this equation and throughout the lecture, I'll use a notational convention where the upper sign is for a boson, and the lower sign is for a fermion. This will let me Do ca do two calculations at once. Um, okay, so that's the um, occupation number of a single mode. Can I say that again? Oh, yes, thank you. Thanks. Um, okay. So that's the occupation number of a single mode. And now if I want to calculate, say, the total energy density, I need to sum over modes. That is, uh, sum over particle species, spin states, and momenta. Um, energy density. Um, so, uh, into the sum over momenta, um, the way the mode counting turns out is that. Uh, in a box with volume V, if the volume is large, then uh, the sum over momenta can be approximated by um, V times the integral of V3P with the usual factor of 2 pi cubed. And uh, to derive that, the derivation is really short if you assume that the box has periodic boundary conditions. If you use some other boundary conditions, then you'll get the same answer. The mode counting is like a volume effect that, um, to a lowest order, shouldn't depend on the boundary conditions. Um, so if the box has periodic boundary conditions, then uh, a wave number in the box, let's say the box has dimensions Lx, Ly, and Lz. Um, by the way, nothing that I've done uh, has mentioned the expanding universe yet. So uh, you can just pretend that these are physical distances in a non-expanding universe and not worry about the distinction between co-moving and physical distance. Um, so the, uh, 
in this box, if periodic boundary conditions are imposed, then uh, wave numbers, k, or momenta, if h bar is 1, uh, have to be quantized like this. They have to be uh, integer multiples of call it nx times 2 pi over lx. And y times 2 pi over L. This is how, if you forget this rule for um, how the mode counting works when you sum over momenta, here's how you can remember it. Um, if I have a uh, wave function of the form e to the ip dot x, then uh, that's only a single valued wave function in a box with periodic boundary conditions if the uh, wave numbers are quantized like this. Uh, so I can think of the wave numbers as living on, so wave numbers are quantized, and they live on a lattice uh, whose volume is 2 pi cubed over Lx, Ly, Lz, or in other words, 2 pi cubed over the volume of the box. Um, so summing over momenta, would be the same thing as um, doing the integral and then dividing out this um, volume in, um, in p space that is putting in a factor of v over 2 pi cubed. Uh, okay. So now, if I want to compute, say, the uh, total energy density of the plasma, The energy density would be the total energy over the volume, and uh, the total energy would be a sum over species, spins, and momenta p, uh, where the quantity that I would be summing would be, if I want to compute the total energy, would be the mean occupation number, which is counting particles in the mode, times the energy per particle. Then uh, I'll leave in the sum over species. And uh, write the sum over spins and momenta like this, where uh, g is the number of spin states. So, uh, for a photon, or more generally for any massless particle, that would be two. There are two physical polarizations. Um, for uh, a massive particle of spin s, there are two s plus one spin states. It would be two s plus one. Uh, times uh, fp times. Well, let me write that as. Oh, sorry, I forgot to put the V here. Um, but uh, that's going to cancel against this V. Um, now let me write this integral a little differently. I'm going to... Uh, Integrate out the angular variables. So that'll bring in a factor of, um, put the g here. That'll bring in a factor of 4 pi p squared. And uh, then I'll combine the 4 pi with the 1 over 2 pi cubed to make this g over 2 pi squared times ep times the fp which I'll write out as e to the minus
Um, so this is a formula for the uh, contribution of uh, particle species to the energy density of a uh, thermal plasma that uh, generalizes the usual black body formula for statistical mechanics to the case where the particle has, can either be a, a boson or a fermion, uh, can have any spin or number of spin states, um, and uh, can have a mass which is not necessarily zero. Um, in general, the, this integral can't be done analytically, but uh, it'll be useful to, this is the exact you know, expression, and uh, it'll be useful to have expressions for rho in the relativistic and non-relativistic limits. So I'll derive those next. So the relativistic limit is the case when the temperature is much larger than the rest mass and the non-relativistic li limit is the opposite. So it's just a matter of considering this integral I think I have enough time to this up So uh, in the relativistic limit, I can make the approximation that E is approximately P. Let me write this as the integral of dP times P cubed E to the minus P over T. Oh, sorry, this should be E to the minus. I made a blackboard typo. Okay, and now there's a trick for doing this integral, which uh, the same trick as the usual black body spec calculation in statistical mechanics, where uh, you um, sort of undo the step of summing a geometric series to expand this denominator. So I can write this like, term like this, and. Uh, The way the signs work out is that uh, if the particle were a boson so that this sign were a minus, then all the signs in this next line would be positive. And if the particle were a fermion so that this sign were positive, then the signs in this expression would alternate. Uh, now each shot. Uh, each term in this sum um, should be p cubed. Uh, now, each term in this sum can be integrated uh, using uh, one of the formulas that was on the blackboard last time. The integral of uh, x cubed times e to the minus x is uh, 3 factorial. And uh, then I also get a factor of t to the fourth when I change variables x equals p over t. Um, and here it would be a factor of um, t t over 2 to the fourth. So I can do all these integrals. This. And then uh, As you also recall from last time, this infinite series is either pi to the fourth over 90 or 7 eighths times pi to the fourth over 90. Uh, depending on whether the particle is a boson or. Um, so, uh, I can write the final result. Put it up here. 
as a the usual notation for writing the final result is uh, so this is uh, let me remind you that this is in the relativistic limit. Uh, so to write it this way, g star is defined to be one for a boson. Sorry, g for a boson, or seven eighths g for a fermion. This uh, this generalizes the usual black body energy density and statistical mechanics, where um, since the photon is massless, it's always relativistic, and uh, g is the photon is a boson, and g is equal to. Uh, in general, a fermion makes seven eighths the contribution to the energy density of a thermal plasma as a uh, boson. Sorry, sorry. Oh, the M is the uh, the particle mass. This formula applies to a massless particle, or more generally, any particle whose mass is much lower than the plasma. Um, and by the way, Sometimes when I make an approximation, like uh, approximating E is P, um, then uh, just to make sure I really understand that approximation, I like to try to um, revisit the calculation, calculating like the first subleading term, or maybe just <laughs> determining its par parametric size. And so uh, you can show, if you go through that exercise here, that uh, corrections to this are of, the of fractional order M over T. If you wanted to check, so the t to the fourth would become t to the fourth times one plus a term of order m over t plus more t. Um, if you wanted to just be 100% sure that the uh, approximation here was correct, although I, the approximation makes total physics. Um, okay. Now for the non-relativistic limit where t is much less than m. So here the approximation that I want to make is to approximate this denominator by one. If um, If the rest mass is much larger than the temperature, then uh, this exponential is um, you know, exponentially small, even if p equals zero and is further suppressed if p is non. Um, so I can just ignore this exponential compared to the one. Then uh, this is not a trivial integral to do, but if I change variables from p to E, so if I define E equals square root so that uh, E D E E D P, then uh, I can write the integral this way. The next, um, so one factor of p got absorbed here into e d e, and then uh, this. So there were two factors of e here, and then this, the remaining factor of p, became the square root of e squared. And uh, the integral here is going to run from m to infinity. 
Uh, then in the next line, I can change variables to make one more change of variable. Is, uh, instead of integrating e from m to infinity, I'll define epsilon equals e minus m and uh, integrate from epsilon equals 0 to infinity. So this would become m plus epsilon squared This term is the square root of e minus m times e plus m. So a nice way to write it is this times e to the minus epsilon plus m. So the next step, let's say I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to pull out this e, e to the minus m over t in front. So that uh, have e to the minus epsilon over t. And then uh, in, the, in the part that uh, remains, I'm just going to set epsilon equals 0 everywhere. Or, or rather, I'm going to keep the lowest order term in epsilon. And uh, you can check that. Um, the reason that that's a good approximation, keeping the, the leading behavior in epsilon, is that if t is large, this exponential is cutting off really fast. So that uh, I only see this factor when epsilon is close to 0. Um, you can check that if you were to leave these terms in. If you were to calculate, say, one subleading term, then uh, the pieces that you get are suppressed by um, powers of, of uh, m over t. Sorry, T over M. Okay, so with that approximation, it this says T over two, 2 pi squared times E to the minus M over uh, and m squared times a uh, 2m to the 1 half um, times a, uh, we write it as t to the 3 halves, uh, times a 1 half factorial from integrating epsilon to the 1 half times e to the minus epsilon, which is uh, square root pi over 2. Factor. Uh, and I'll write the final result like this. The only part of this that we really need is the exponential suppression. Um, so, unlike the relativistic case where the um, density decreases with decreasing temperature as t to the fourth. Uh, here we find an exponential suppression once the temperature of the plasma falls below the rest mass. Um, so that would describe, for example, this process of E plus E minus annihilation. When uh, the temperature is higher than the uh, rest masses of the positrons and electrons, then the positrons and electrons are relativistic and they contribute to the same energy density at the same level as the photons, um, I guess with a factor of 7 eighths because their electrons are fermions. Um, but uh, once the temperature falls below this, then the thermodynamically favored state is for the electrons and the positrons to annihilate each other. And uh, at that point, there, um, you know, that, that process is described quantitatively by this equation, which tells you how the um, energy density in electrons exponentially suppresses the temperature falls. Um, so, uh,
Um, oh, how I got from here to here. Uh, oh, yeah, so here I just, my reasoning was that uh, if, um, let's see, let me, let me actually in this step put the e to the, e to the minus m over t here. And e to the, e to the minus epsilon. So that uh, in this step, all that's happening is that I'm just setting m equals 0 in these um, leading terms. And uh, the way you can think about that is that this, if you think about these two factors, uh, if t is uh, small compared to m, then uh, this exponential factor is cutting off really fast. Like if here's t, then e to the epsilon, e to the minus epsilon over t is uh, a very fast cutoff. Uh, whereas this factor is varying more slowly. So if uh, this is the expression in brackets here. So the uh, part that contributes to the integral is just the part where epsilon is small. And it's an OK approximation to just uh, you know, approximate this as a constant. Um, that's the hand-waving explanation. Now, uh, if you want to check formally, so I just kept the, actually, I didn't draw it very well. I should have drawn the leading behavior as, the leading behavior is epsilon to the 1 half, right? So it's epsilon to the 1 half. This expression in brackets is uh, epsilon to the 1 half times sub subleading behavior that would go as epsilon to the 3 halves. Um, now, uh, I think it's very useful to, um, if you have this hand-waving intuition and you want to really check that it's correct, um, to check it by computing a subleading term. Um, so this term scales as m to the 5 halves times epsilon to the 1 half. And uh, if you work out the next subleading term, it goes as one fewer power of m and one more power of epsilon. It would go like this. And uh, then if I put that into the final answer, then I'll get a subleading term of order uh, m to the 3 halves times t to the 5 halves times e to the minus m over t. The numerical prefactor here will involve three halves factorial and some other terms, but this is just the parametric form. And uh, that's um, small compared to this term because I'm assuming that the temperature is much lower than M. Um, I often do this sort of thing. I feel like I don't really understand an approximation until I can compute the first subleading term. But uh, it's a totally fair question to ask because it's not obvious at all. Right? Um, it would if the uh, positrons and electrons existed in equal numbers so that those two modes could stay in thermal equilibrium. Uh, what happens in our standard cosmological model is that there are more electrons than um, positrons by a small amount, so that the leftover, you know, they almost annihilate, um, and uh, the leftover electrons are the electrons that form the luminous matter in our universe. Um, and so that's just a free parameter. That asymmetry is not captured by these thermodynamic arguments, and it's just a free parameter of the theory. Um, my understanding, this is outside my expertise, but uh, my understanding is that it's an open problem whether QCD can produce the observed level of um, like baryon anti baryon asymmetry in our universe um, through non perturbative processes. Uh, okay, so summarizing for a single species. Let's see, this is, a, this is an important enough equation that I'm going to say it's leftmost board worthy. <laughs> so 
So for a single species, rho of t is uh, always given exactly for all values of the temperature by doing this integral. Where, uh, As always, EP is the square root of P squared over M squared. And uh, in the relativistic and non-relativistic limits, it looks like this form, which goes as t to the fourth and looks more or less like the usual black body law. And uh, than this exponentially suppressed form. D much lower. Um, okay. Now, um, so now we understand pretty well what happens as we go through this line in the diagram. Um, except for one little detail that we haven't worked out yet. Um, which uh, is a little, it's a little messy. <laughs> and that is the uh, evolution of the temperature with the scale factor. So, there are two clocks, the scale factor A and the temperature T. And uh, we haven't uh, quite worked out how they relate. Um, here, in th here at the very, uh, at very late times, when all that's happening is that, um, you know, there's no plasma anymore, the photons are, the CMB photons are just free streaming, uh, then uh, it, it, it is the case that uh, if all that's happening is that every photon is passively redshifting as one over the scale factor, that uh, the temperature is, the CMB temperature is just decreasing as one over A. Uh, but uh, that is almost but not quite true um, in, in previous stages, such as during the stage of E plus E minus annihilation. So we're going to uh, work out what happens. Um, so uh, first I'd like to say, just conceptually, that one way of working this out, there's actually, there's more, actually more, than, more than one way of doing this calculation, and different ways of calculating actually are, are, are kind of different from each other. But, but here's one way of doing it. So, uh, Last time I mentioned the continuity equation. If we want to know how, you know, the temperature, the temperature is related to the energy density by this formula. And uh, if we want to know how that changes with the scale factor, we can use the continuity equation. Or this, this P is the pressure. Um. And uh, the pressure, I said last time, was given by you calculate the pressure the same way as you calculate the energy density except that uh, the contribution of each particle to the energy density is, you know, EP. And uh, the contribution of each particle to the pressure, it turns out to be P squared over 3 EP. That was a formula that was on the board last time. And then you, you also have the occupation. So it's... Uh, so this factor is... Uh, EP over 3 in the relativistic limit. Um, that for a gas of relativistic particles, the pressure is one third of the energy density. And uh, gets suppressed for a non relativistic particle where P is becoming small, and, but EP is still equal to the rest mass. Um, now, the pressure can be calculated. Uh, this is an integral that's very similar to this. And uh, it can be calculated using the same method in the relativistic and non-relativistic limits. Calculation is very similar. I'm just going to 
summarize the result of that calculation. So just like rho, there's an integral which is always exact. And then the relativistic limit, you get, uh, well, a nice way of writing the answer is rho over 3. Um, and the non-relativistic limit, um, it can be written like this. It has the same exponential suppression as the density with an additional suppression of 1 power of t over m. Uh, I claim that this is the ideal gas law in disguise, the ideal gas law from chemistry. Think about why that's true a little. Okay, so now uh, I want to emphasize that in principle we have all the equations uh, on the blackboard that we would need to determine the evolution of the temperature with the scale factor. Um, so we have these equations, which are um, these integral expressions, which are not differential equations. They just relate the temperature at any time to the uh, density and the pressure. So the density and the pressure are just functions of temperature. And uh, then we have this equation. So we're trying to uh, integrate this equation. Where, and we have a first order differential equation telling us how uh, the density, which is just sort of, a, all, you know, almost the same thing as the temperature, they're just related to each other algebraically, um, is related to some other function of the temperature. Uh, so that would be enough to integrate on the computer, to integrate this uh, one differential equation in one unknown and determine the temperature for all values of the scale factor. Um, so, uh, for example, if all particles are relativistic, then, uh, then it's easy to see how to integrate this. The um, total pressure would be the total uh, density over 3, and uh, d rho over d log a would be minus 4 rho, which means that rho is evolving as a to the minus 4. And uh, if all particles are relativistic, then it's also true that rho, uh, rho is proportional to t to the 4, so the temperature is scaling as a to the minus 1. Uh, now, it's actually true that most of the time, in this plasma, all particles are relativistic. Um, well before E plus E minus annihilation, for example, the plasma consists of um, photons, electrons, and positrons. And uh, they're all relativistic if the temperature is much larger than this. And uh, after the annihilation, if we go well after the annihilation, then uh, E plus and E minus are no longer relativistic, but they're also an exponentially suppressed. So their contribution to uh, rho and p is very small. So in, in both of these regimes, either, either well before the annihilation event or well after the annihilation event, the temperature is proportional to 1 over a. And uh, the part we haven't computed yet is what happens during the annihilation. Uh, now, we have all the equations on the board that we would need on the computer, say, to integrate the temperature through the annihilation and follow its evolution. Um, the thing that's really, but it looks like a mess. We have this differential equation where the quantities that are are like functions of the temperature defined by these integrals. Um, but uh, what's sort of nice is that it turns out that there's an exact solution. There's a conservation law that says that um, 
this combination of quantities, the um, uh, density plus the pressure divided by the temperature times A cubed is constant. And, uh, and so that will let you follow the um, uh, evolution of the temperature uh, throughout the thermal history. Mm. Yes, yes. Um, the cosmological constant is uh, negligible at these times. Uh, dark matter is uh, also negligible because it's assumed... Uh, so dark matter is... Today I was going to mostly talk about the neutrino background. Uh, dark matter is what I was would talk about next. Uh, so uh, in, for example, the thermal WIMP dark matter model, the dark matter uh, um, freezes out, like the neutrinos. It freezes out, but somewhere much earlier on this time. And uh, its abundance turns out to be much smaller than the um, species that we're following here, the electrons, positrons. Oh, I'm going to derive it. So, uh, so the derivation, the derivation is non-trivial. Uh, so it's going to take a few blackboards, I think. I think I have enough time. Okay, yeah, I have enough time. So uh, it's going to look like a big algebraic coincidence involving a lot of cancellations between terms that this conservation law um, applies. And uh, let me just remark that there is a conception in advance that there is a conceptual explanation for it, namely it's uh, entropy conservation in disguise, where. Uh, This quantity on the left-hand side is entropy per unit co-moving volume. And uh, the expansion of the universe is an adiabatic process where thermal equilibrium is maintained. And so you would expect the uh, entropy to be conserved. Um, but uh, I didn't like that argument because it involves a certain... Statistical mechanics is really powerful, but it can also involve a certain amount of hand-waving. And I often like, really have to do my own thinking to decide whether the arguments are really like, airtight or not. And uh, so I kind of like the brute force algebra approach uh, showing how to derive this, given the equations, the continuity equation, and uh, these integrals that we've already derived. But there's more than one way of doing it. Okay, so uh, in my brute force algebra approach, I want to start with this lemma that says that the partial derivative of the pressure, so uh, the pressure is given by this uh, formula, and density by this formula. And uh, if I just take the partial derivative of the, the pressure, differentiate that uh, integral expression with respect to the temperature, then I get uh, rho. Sorry, this should be a P, not a rho. Then I get uh, rho plus P over T. Here's the proof. Um, so uh, first let me write let me write the integral expressions for rho and p slightly differently. So here is my integral expression for rho. Um, in hindsight, maybe it's bad notation that I'm using P for pressure and also momentum in the integrals. I probably should have used Q for the momentum or something. So uh, if I change variables in this integral from P to E, I can write it this way, which will turn out to be more convenient.
Uh, I've taken this occupation number and just written it as f. And uh, the only thing that I want to remember about that function f is that it only, it only depends on the ratio e over t. And uh, similarly, if I take the integral expression for p, the pressure, and change variables from momentum to energy, I can write it like this. times the occupation number, which I'll write as f of e over t. Uh, now we'll, um, take the partial derivative of this line. When I differentiate this with respect to temperature, I get minus e over t squared times f prime of e over t. Now, uh, there's a little non-obvious trick here. Uh, I want to do an integration by parts, so I want to convert this to a derivative with respect to e. So I'm going to write this as minus e over t times the partial derivative of f with respect to uh, e. So you could think about this step in reverse. If I were to evaluate this partial derivative, then I would uh, put a prime on f, and then I would bring out a factor of 1 over t from the chain rule. And uh, I'll continue over here. Um, okay. So uh, in the next step, I'm just going to... Um, do an integration by parts where I take this derivative and uh, bring it out and let it operate on these terms with a minus sign. Write that as notes I wrote it this way. It's easier to switch. made an unfortunate mistake, which is erasing formula that I'm actually going to use. Stop. Over to F of you. This is integrating by parts. And uh, a few compare. So now I've gotten rid of the derivatives uh, on f. And if you compare this expression to the formulas that I unfortunately just, relate, just erased, this is p over t plus rho over t. Um, let, me, let me put those up again just so that Previously, I had these equations up. Okay. 
¿Qué es eso? Um, oh, yeah, that's a good question. I didn't actually think about that. So uh, this uh, uh, here to see that those surface terms are zero, um, I would need to um, you know look at this factor times this factor in the limits where e goes to zero and e goes to infinity. So you can see uh, this factor is going to, when e goes to zero, this factor goes to zero because I have the e here. And uh, when, um, oh, actually, that's, yeah, that wasn't right. This integral goes from m to infinity. So it's this, it's this factor that's going to zero at the lower endpoint. And uh, when e goes to infinity, then uh, this factor is exponentially suppressed because it has a Boltzmann factor of e to the minus e over t in it. That was a good question. Uh, okay. So, now I can give the proof that So the equations that um, structure it like this. Now that, now that we've proven this lemma, we can do the proof of the conservation law. So first, for the first step, um, I decided to organize the proof by showing that the derivative of this quantity with respect to log a was zero. Um, so uh, I want to write that derivative as three terms. derivative of t with respect to log n. Um, and, uh, sorry, sir? Oh, yes, thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to call this equation star and come back to it. And uh, then I'm going to work on this um, derivative for a bit. So the derivative of... Uh, Rho plus p respect to log a. Let's see, I'm going to write the p derivative as the Partial derivative with respect to temperature times the temperature derivative with respect to log a. Um, so this is a <laughs> this is a row. This is a p. A row. This is a. And uh, then the equations that we have to work with are the continuity equation, which says that this derivative is minus three times rho plus p. And uh, then our lemma that says that this derivative, so that was by the continuity equation. 
And uh, then our lemma that says that this derivative was rho plus p over p. Lemma? Times dt for d log a. And uh, now if you plug in to on the right-hand side of star, you can see that you get zero. Um, this term will exactly cancel. When I put this term in here, it will exactly cancel the first term. And uh, this term, when I put it in here, will cancel the third term. Um, so that finishes the proof of the conservation law. Um, I'm going to try to squeeze this equation in over here. So as the thermal plasma evolves, a cubed times p plus rho over t is a constant. Okay, now um, I think that way of writing it is physically natural because it you can remember that it's entropy conservation. There's a the way that it's usually written in the cosmology textbooks in the cosmology literature is as follows. I wanted to find g tote to be a function of time. Now, there are a few different g's, so I always use uh, um, I always use g with no subscript to mean the number of spin states of a species. G star too would be the same thing with a factor of seven eighths for a fermion. And uh, g tote will be this function. Tote g to the fourth. And uh, this is defined so that if all species are relativistic, that is to say, if the contribution of the non-relativistic species is, is negligible. Um, well, let me write it this way. So a, rel a relativistic species contributes g star to g tau. And uh, Non-relativistic um, makes it with, in other words, with m much larger than t, um, makes an exponentially small contribution. Um, so with that definition, this conservation law, the entropy conservation, is equivalent to the statement that the temperature evolves as a to the minus one times g tote to the minus one third. Uh, the combination, if you plug this in here, the combination g tote times d times t cubed uh, times a cubed is constant. Um, so, uh, so we can figure out now what happens to the, this is a nice way of writing it if we want to follow the evolution of the temperature through e plus c minus annihilation. Um, so let's work out g tote either in the limits where, of, of uh, being well before e plus e minus annihilation or well after. Um, so 
So before, let me start with after. Uh, after the E plus the E minus, e minus annihilation, the positrons and electrons are exponentially suppressed, and the only species that contributes is the photon. Um, and so its contribution is just two for the number of helicities or spin states, uh, times one because it's a boson. Uh, before the annihilation, so there's uh, the same factor of two times one from the photon. Uh, plus for the electrons and positrons, there's one factor of two because there are two species, the E plus and the E minus. Another factor of two because a spin one half particle has two spins. And then a factor of uh, seven eighths because uh, uh, electrons and positrons are fermions. Uh, for a total of uh, 11 halves. Uh, so from this rule that says that the temperature goes as g tote to the minus one third, we see that uh, during the annihilation event, before the annihilation event, the temperature is going as 1 over A, and the same is true afterwards. But uh, during the annihilation event, uh, G tote increases by um, a fact decreases by a factor of uh, 11 fourths. And so the temperature would go up by, the temperature would get boosted by a factor of 11 fourths to the 1 third. Uh, and uh, that's just the energy that the electrons and positrons release into the plasma when they annihilate. Um, I'll, uh, I only have about five minutes left, so I'll just maybe not uh, skip over a few details, a few fine points that uh, might be interesting to talk about. But uh, so this factor of this factor of uh, four elevenths between G toad before and after the uh, E plus annihilation uh, is the factor of, I said that we were going to talk today about the prediction of a cosmic neutrino background. For the CNB temperature is predicted to be four elevenths to the one third times the CNB temperature. Uh, so the reason that happens is that you know, the neutrinos freeze out s before, but slightly before, the uh, E plus C minus annihilation. So that uh, the temperature of, you know, the thermal plasma, including the photons, scales like this. Whereas uh, the electrons are free streaming. They're not coupled to the thermal plasma. They don't receive any of the energy from E plus C minus annihilation. And so the neutrino temperature is just scaling as a to the minus one. And uh, that happens all the way from when the neutrinos decouple at one MeV to today. So um, because of this factor of G tote, the uh, 
CMB temperature is boosted by a factor of 11 fourths to the one third relative to the neutrino. Um, another interesting thing about neutrinos is that uh, so far I've assumed whenever I've talked about neutrinos that the neutrino mass is zero. Uh, in fact, we know from the neutrino oscillation experiments that that can't be true, that the minimum, for the neutrino mass oscillation experiments, uh, what they actually measure is mass squared differences between uh, neutrino species. And uh, if you leave those mass squared differences fixed to the um, observed values from the oscillation experiments and make the lightest neutrino massless, then you, did, then you deduce that the sum of the neutrino masses must be greater than, uh, I think the number, if I remember correctly, is 46 milli electron volts. Very small mass. Um, interestingly, cosmology is sensitive to uh, neutrino masses of this order. Uh, if I take a cosmic neutrino background at this temperature, and uh, then I give each particle in that neutrino background uh, mass, then uh, the uh, total energy density that you get is, this is a calculation that I was going to do today, but I will have to omit, omit the details for, since we're at the end of the lecture. Um, so if I take this cosmic neutrino background and then just give each particle a mass, uh, then uh, I can calculate the total energy density of that sea of neutrino particles and then uh, compare it to the total energy density of the universe today. Um, that's known pretty well because Friedman's equation relates it to the Hubble expansion rate today, which is something that we can go out and measure by looking at supernovae. So then uh, if you do that calculation, putting in the numbers for the observed Hubble expansion rate today, then uh, here's a nice way of writing the answer. Some of the neutrino mass is over 43 eV. That's one way of writing it. And uh, so even if the neutrino mass were as uh, small as um, 43 electron volts, which is a very small mass for a particle, it would be an order one effect in cosmology. But cosmology is super sensitive. Uh, Ah, uh, well, one way of putting it is that just like with dark matter, we've never seen a dark matter scattering event. We could still infer the existence of dark matter gravitationally. And uh, that's kind of what's going on here, even if the, 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 neutrino back, the cosmic neutrino background is um, very uh, low energy and very hard to detect. Um, but the gravitational effect is huge. Um, so, uh, in fact, since cos in cosmology, uh, Cosmology is sort of in a precision state where we're sensitive to percent level effects. You might uh, guess that we'd be sensitive to a neutrino mass that was about 1% of this value. And uh, that's right, the current, cos the current cosmological constraint on the sum of the neutrino masses uh, is uh, about 120 milli electron volts at 95%. This result, this current constraint, is uh, 36 hours old. The uh, newest Planck uh, parameters papers, parameter papers came out two evenings ago. Uh, so uh, we're approaching, because uh, this thermal history predicts the existence of this cosmic neutrino background, and uh, that turns out to have a surprisingly large gravitational effect. Uh, cosmology gives by far the best upper bound on the neutrino mass which is not too far away from the lower bound from the particle physics experiments. And uh, it's likely that cosmology, that the two will cross soon and, cos and that cosmology will, and that will pin down the neutrino mass um, in the not too distant future. Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, obviously there's way more that I could uh, tell you about in cosmology. Three lectures just sort of scratches the surface. <laughs> but uh, I got to talk about a lot of interesting stuff and I hope you guys uh, enjoyed it as much as I did. Thanks.
Questions? And again, the day 11 quarters, why it's not 11 halves? Because there was a right before, right after. Um, oh, yeah, I, sort of, I, I, I probably should have put an equation up for that, but I'm just comparing the g-toad before to the g-toad after. Yeah, so that I understand the 11 quarters, but then when you compare with neutrinos, shouldn't you be... Com I'm confused. Why am I not comparing uh, uh, between when they freeze out and when, they and when the electrons annihilate? Can you explain the relative coefficient between the neutrinos and the photons? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the... Uh, Sorry. Um, the photon temperature, if I were to plot the photon temp temperature as a function of the scale factor, then what would happen is it would, it would decrease as A inverse. And uh, then during the E plus C minus annihilation, it receives a little boost. So, uh, the photon temperature relative to um, a decreases a to the minus one is getting boosted by a factor of 11 fourths to, to the one third. Uh, the neutrinos start out in thermal equilibrium with the photons, but then uh, they just uh, decouple and redshift. So they stay as t proportional to a to the minus one forever. The neutrinos. You look unconvinced. Um, would you Let's say I plotted A T. As a function of A. Then uh, that would be constant and then go up by a factor of 11 fourths. I, I'm just saying the same thing. So, but um, if g toad changes by a factor of 11 fourths and the temperature changes by 11 fourths to the one third. So, um, uh, I didn't understand why exactly the temperature of neutrino goes like a, a to an inverse of A without the um, g toad. Oh yeah, that unfortunately was something I had to skip over. I, ki I kind of ran out of time at the end and probably should have paced the lecture better. Uh, so uh, let me just write down some equations for that. I, um, so all of these, all of these equations that are describing a thermal plasma, like this occupation number, um, are, uh, assuming thermal equilibrium. But, uh, free streaming is different. So what, uh, what's happening with the neutrinos is that at high redshift, say at some, at some scale factor A1 before they freeze out, uh, the neutrinos are in thermal equilibrium with the plasma that has some temperature T1. So at, at, at A equals A1, the uh, mean occupation number of the neutrinos would have this thermal form. I'll neglect the neutrino mass and just put in a P. Uh, let me pretend, for simplicity, let me pretend that neutrino freeze out is instantaneous. So let, let E1 be the redshift of freeze out. So at that redshift, the uh, uh, neutrinos are thermal. Um, now what happens at subsequent redshifts is that they uh, they've lost thermal contact with the plasma. So they just free stream, which is to say that the 
momenta or redshifting like this? Given one particle, one neutrino, its momentum just redshifts like this at some uh, subsequent time, subsequent value of the scale factor H. Uh, now, if that's happening to every particle in this ensemble, then uh, what happens to the, let me denote this F sub 1 of P, or the occupation number at the time A1. What would happen at subsequent scale factor A2 is that uh, The occupation number at some redshifted momentum P would just be the occupation number F1 at that blue shifted momentum P times A2 over A1. So that would be two over A1. And uh, you can see that that's the same thing as a Boltzmann distribution, where I define P2 to be P1 times A1 over A2. So it's, what I've really shown here is that if I take a uh, black body or a thermal distribution, and I uh, redshift every particle by some factor, that I always get another black body with a redshifted value of the temperature. Um, but uh, it just happens to be the case that redshifting the universe preserves the black body spectrum, uh, even though the particles are no longer in thermal equilibrium. The answer that you get is a looks like the Boltzmann distribution at some new temperature. Uh, but now the point is that in this free streaming process, um, it doesn't matter what the plasma is doing. It doesn't matter whether things are annihilating. This calculation just showed that the temperature, the effect of temperature that enters the um, occupation number uh, is just related to the previous temperatures by redshifting as one of ray. That's why if a species is in, causal con is in thermal equilibrium with the plasma and then freezes out at some point, then uh, it's assuming that it's relativistic throughout, then uh, its temperature would go as a to the minus one times g tote to the minus one third uh, before freeze out and a to the minus one after freeze out. Um, so if the neutrinos had, uh, by the way, I never derived why the neutrinos freeze out a, at a temperature of 1 MeV. That's uh, like not a trivial calculation. Um, but uh, if it had come out differently and they had frozen out, say, before um, mu plus mu, mu, mu minus annihilation, when the g-tote was even higher, then the predicted temperature of the cosmic neutrino background would be a little lower. Um, oh, yeah, why is it MeV? Well, you might wonder why it's not like 10 TeV, the electroweak scale. And uh, so it turns out that, uh, so the one sentence answer is that something like, if I remember correctly, the electroweak scale to the four thirds over M Planck to the one third, uh, where the Planck scale um, sneaks into the calculation because Friedman's equation has a G in it, which is M Planck to the minus one half. And, uh, the way that you get this is you compare the, um, uh, the scattering rate or the number of um, scattering events. So the scattering events that I'm talking about are events that would say 
where a neutrino can scatter off of an electron. So exchanging a Z boson. Uh, and uh, compare the, the things that you want to compare are the um, scattering rate or the number of scattering events per unit time per particle to the Hubble rate or the characteristic size of the universe, you know, increased by a constant factor. Um, so if you, if you do that comparison, then, um, you know, things enter like the A to the minus 3 scaling of the particle density. The, um, the Hubble rate has a G in it. You, you get some answer. I'm not, I'm not sure that I can quite reproduce the details of the blackboard, but that's, that's roughly how it works. Um, that's right, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. When the, uh, if the, um, if, a, if a particle scatters many times in one doubling of the universe, yeah, then the particles stay in equilibrium as the universe. Any other questions? Uh, why don't the photons freeze out, and will they ever? Um, well, uh, you could say that the photons are... I suppose you could say that the photons freeze out here, since that's when there are no more electrons for them to scatter off of. Um, this diagram, every time I look at this diagram, I just think of all the things that are missing. Like I. Uh, I didn't mention, for example, that at like 100 keV is, uh, is Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which is a really interesting step that determines, for example, the number of neutrons in the universe relative to the number of protons. Um, Okay, let's thank Kendrick again. Thanks. And we'll be back at 2.